got an audience. Oh, it's lovely to be here, it really is. I, I myself am very excited. I recently became a father again. Thank you. Thank you. For the fourth time. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> My wife said to me, I want a child. And I thought, can I be doing all this again? Do I want to go through with it? The lifting, the carrying, the mopping up of the spillages. And that's just when you're making love, trying to have the child. <laughs> because I'll be honest with you, I'm no great shakes when it comes to sex. I'm not. I know it's a shocker, isn't it? It really is. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm what women call a disappointment. <laughs> I think there's a lot of pressure on the man nowadays when it comes to sex. There's great pressure on the man to be in the driving seat. And not just when you're dogging. <laughs> I mean all the time. And whenever we would go to the bedroom to try and create this new life, I would feel such pressure. I felt I was being watched, like I was being judged. I felt like I was on Strictly Come Shagging. Well, there we are, blah, 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 blah. Rob Brydon and his wife going at it hammer and tongs. <laughs> I'm doing Bruce Forsyth. <laughs> Come join us, the two of you. Come and join us. Wipe yourselves down. There we are. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. I loved what you were doing. I really did. I loved what you did with the hips, Rob. That was lovely. And the way you always kept one foot on the ground at all times. <laughs> But let's see what our judges made of it. First of all, Craig Revel Horwood. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought it was terrible. I thought he was quite limp. <laughs> all right, a bit limp. Never mind from Craig. Disappointing. What about Len Goodman? Len Goodman. Well, you know. <laughs> I mean, I think Rob will be the first to admit he's not a natural lovemaker. <laughs> A lot of what he was doing out there was positively unnatural. <laughs> I mean, he popped out at one point. <laughs> it was horrible to see Seven. Well, Seven, yeah, disappointing. I'm doing Bruce again. Disappointing. <laughs> what about our third judge, Bruno Tognoli? <laughs> I love it! He was fast! He was furious! He was in, out, in, out, in, out! Yes, he popped out! But he's straight back in! <laughs> Nine! And all the comedians do it. They come out and they'll tell you a little anecdote and you'll be like, oh, yeah, he's the posh one. And there's loads of them. <laughs> or she's the one with OCD. Or he's the one that pretends he's a feminist to get more puss. <laughs> <laughs> all of them. <laughs> all the straight ones. So... I guess the thing to tell you about me, so you get my vibe, is um, a little while ago, I put on makeup to Skype a baby. <laughs> <laughs> That's my vibe. I used to be, and this is going to sound really braggy, but I used to be, honestly, I used to be the prettiest, cleverest girl in my class, but I was homeschooled, so. <laughs> academic at school actually but I loved philosophy and I still love philosophy like I'm always thinking about life's big questions the other day I was thinking what if all this time it was shaggy <laughs> I am um, I've been on a man ban uh, well it's over now I can't stress that enough let the dog see the rabbit <laughs> But I was in a man band for a year, right? And that was to reset my patterns so that I didn't fancy skateboarders. <laughs> I had, like, commitment issues with guys, I would say. Not as bad as my friend Shannon, though. Oh, my God. My friend Shannon, the biggest a-hole in the room, she would identify him and be like, yeah, I love him. <laughs> she... Like, you know when you've got commitment issues and you attract other people with commitment issues because like attracts like, but you don't realise you're part of the problem? <laughs> So Shannon, one day, she decided, right, I want to go out with a good guy. I want to get married. Right, so she popped herself on Guardian Soulmates, just popped herself on. And she was still attracting hookups. So I said, well, let me have a look at your profile, because I'm very emotionally intelligent. And... You what? <laughs> I, 
actually, because straight away I spotted the problem, right? So she's on Guardian Soulmates, and she hadn't written enough about herself. And I think that was problem number one, because I think you've got to give of yourself, you've got to be a bit vulnerable, and she hadn't really written a lot. That was the first problem. Second problem was really what she'd written. <laughs> so I'll tell you what she's written, you see if you can see the problem, okay? So she'd just gone with this. In for a penny, in for a pounding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, also, once she set up my cousin John and she kept her coat on. <laughs> Mixed messages. <laughs> so the thing that I would do, right, when I had commitment issues, what I would do is I went through a phase where I'd go out with men, like, way younger than me. I think just because they're around, like, they're not married, they don't know any better, <laughs> and they're easier to catfish. Um, <laughs> how do you know if a man is too young for you? I'll tell you this, this is something I learned. Right, okay, you're out and about, you're on the town, and um, he just asked you to buy him a chalky milkshake. <laughs> that actually happened. <laughs> and then I went back to his. I know, I went back anyway. <laughs> <laughs> his hand soap at his flat was jelly baby flavoured. <laughs> Ooh, Mama got a goal. <laughs> After she slept with you. <laughs> Yeah, so I want to go with older guys now, or age-appropriate, you know, like 35 to 45, big hands. <laughs> Quick show of hands. <laughs> no, <bye. laughs> Your taste changes as you get older. You know, I want someone kind, obviously. You know, I want someone funny. You know, I want someone creative, uh, but not by the truth. Um, <laughs> you know the sort of guy that, yeah, maybe he plays the guitar. But he waits to be asked. <laughs> That's the wonderful thing about tits, for me. As the first time I squeezed one, yay. <laughs> and the last time I squeezed it, yay. <laughs> they never get less fun, titties. <laughs> and I suck them. I'm a, I'm a big tit-sucking man. I suck her tits. <laughs> I suck her tits so much that I know I'm not the boss in the relationship. <laughs> you know what I mean? You, you can't look at a woman while you're, I, I run everything, this is all mine. <laughs> no, it isn't. You're a monkey. <laughs> you're not a human. You're a nipple-sucking monkey man. <laughs> Are you like me? When you suck, when you suck one tit, do you look at the other, like, Stay right there, Lefty. Mm -mm -mm. I'm just practicing on this one. I don't, I don't know how women uh, can look at men and suck their tit without just laughing at them. I don't know how. I really don't. I, I don't know how women can look down at their man, okay, sucking a tit with his eyes rolled back like a feeding shark. <laughs> and have any thought in their head other than, how can you keep a job? <laughs> I can't figure you out. How do you bring money home? <laughs> squeezing one, that's the fun part. I love squeezing and tits, too. You, you, because if you're like me, if you're out there and you're lucky enough uh, to be with a woman that lets you grab her titty willy-nilly, 24-7, without doing this shit. Mm. <laughs> then you, my friend, are living in paradise. <laughs> Screw the recession. Screw government. Screw the war. Just suck her tits till things are better. <laughs> that's what they're there for. I love the morning tit. That's my, my favorite tit. <laughs> we, uh, we wake up at different times. She gets up before me and then starts rummaging through the fridge. I can hear food being moved, so I wake up. And I come down the stairs and she's bent over. And her head's in the fridge and the, the light from the fridge door is going through her nightie. And you can see them just do this. <laughs> My God. There, there is, see, men are looking at this right now and thinking, yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> There's something about that kinetic weirdness. <laughs> Men have toys on our desks that basically do the same thing. 
There she is, eh? I sneak up behind her, eh? Grab a dangler, you know what I mean? <laughs> the nipple's hard, because the fridge door's open, so you don't even have to work for it. I left the country for a while. Gordon Brown was in charge. I came back. Now, apparently, the country's being led by two gay antiques dealers. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. But at least they're getting along. It's Americans, let me explain it to you. There's two parties in America. You probably know this. There's Republicans and Democrats. The Republicans are called the red states. Democrats are the blue states. Uh, the, the blue states are generally either on the West Coast or on the Atlantic seaboard. So basically, uh, Democrat is anyone who's seen water. <laughs> so you go to America, find a Republican, and take him to the beach. And even the Republicans hate each other now. So they have a splinter group called the Teabaggers, the Tea Party, Teabaggers whose leader, of course, is uh, Sarah Palin, future presidential candidate, who spent two years governing 8,000 square miles of snow <laughs> and would occasionally nip out at lunch to blow the head off a moose from 300 yards away. That's presidential material. <laughs> Another woman who's moved to the forefront, uh, running for a senator from Delaware named uh, Christine O'Donnell, who's running on a platform of anti-masturbation. <laughs> she actually wants to make masturbation illegal. I give that law six minutes. Because <laughs> the Bible says it's wrong. These are exact words. Well, if my husband has figured out how to please himself, why am I in the picture? I got news for you. You're not. <laughs> no man ever whacked one out of the ballpark thinking of his wife, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> You'd be thinking of anything. You'd be thinking of a 300-pound Bavarian milkmaid strapped over a barrel are you banger with a kayak paddle wearing a Burger King paper crown and making a call you Mr. King Big Daddy Spanky Bottom? <laughs> you were about to shoot a ropey parabola of manges onto her ham hock buttocks. <laughs> David Hasselhoff walks in dressed as a Luftwaffe pilot and says you've got a tax refund coming. <laughs> and if that's wrong, I don't want to be right! <laughs> the second problem with my puppy is, um... He's interfering with my sex life, <laughs> which I wasn't expecting. Um, he's a dog. I thought he doesn't know what we're doing. It's fine. You can carry on with your romantic life. He likes to watch. <laughs> he's, he's absolutely fascinated, which is very off-putting. You don't want to meet eyes with your puppy when you've got a dick in your mouth. <laughs> it's, very, it's very distracting. And um, also, he's got incredible timings with his vocalizations. If I am lost in the moment, I'll be, um, I'll be like, um, oh. <laughs> That's how I sound. And, um, and, and my boyfriend, he's much more like, oh. <laughs> and then the puppy goes, oh, oh. <laughs> really distracting, ruins everything. Says so anything, Sarah, be an adult. Put your dog outside the bedroom door, close the door. It makes it worse. He is so desperate to get back in. He knows we're having fun. And, um, and it becomes more distracting. I tried to make it like part of a role play. To, uh, I was like, oh, no, no, don't worry about it. That's just, um, we're at the beach. We're at the beach. And that's just the waves scratching angrily at the door. <laughs> and that's just the seagulls barking. <laughs> It became more distracted. We felt too sorry for him. So then what we started doing, the next idea, uh, there's a hotel across the road from us, and it costs £59 a night, and we were popping over there for about an hour. Um, <laughs> that's not too much money. And um, <laughs> popping over there, but there was quite a lot of things to do. It was a lot of fuss. We left at separate times so that the dog didn't know what we were up to. And I, I pretended that I was going to work. I would kind of pack my bag and be like, ooh, back to the grindstone. <laughs> Gotta earn your pedigree chum. <laughs> and then when we got to the hotel, we had to, in, while we were in reception, kind of pretend that we were having an affair. But they can't know that we're hiding from a pet. <laughs> so I'd kind of run in, kiss my boyfriend and go, oh, where does Jill think you are? <laughs> and then when we left 60 minutes later, I'd put the collar up on my coat and go, tell Jill I see her at Zimba on Thursday. <laughs> and, uh, but then we had to stop doing that because I started to feel too guilty about Jill. <laughs> nothing to deserve this, has she? And also quite suspicious of my boyfriend. Well, if he does it to Jill, he'll do it to me. <laughs> Here's a fun fact for you. I am the only comedian in the entire world who's never had a threesome. I'm the only one. They might not talk about it, they're all sex people. They're all of them. Name a single comedian. 
Jimmy Carr had a threesome with Ramesh Ranganathan and Jasper Carrot. <laughs> any comedian, any comedian you like. Catherine Ryan had a threesome with Sue Perkins and Josh Widdicombe. <laughs> every comedian, every comedian's had a threesome. One from over here? David Mitchell had a threesome with Sean Locke and Rob Brydon. Lee Mack was annoyed. <laughs> every, every single comedian has had a threesome apart from me. And if you've had a threesome, I'm so impressed. I'm so impressed because it's so grown up and sexually adventurous. And I feel like I'm too insecure. That's my problem. Whenever an ex-boyfriend has suggested we bring a third person into the room, I'm like, oh, I can do all of it. <laughs> I can do it all. I'll, do, I'll just move my arms and legs quicker. <laughs> Slip around a bit. I'll put on a different voice. Oh, touch my tits. I'll just. I'll, I can do it all. And um, my current boyfriend, we're very much in love. We're in a new relationship. It's very sexy. We've got a puppy. And, um, and even he, kind of, after a couple of drinks, he suggested, oh, maybe you've got a friend who'd like to join us. And I thought, are me and Jill not enough for you? <laughs> anyway, we're back to letting the dog watch. I'm just saying, for me, I remember what it was like to be, like, a virgin. I remember when I first became sexually aware, I woke up with two new friends, my virginity and my libido. But my libido was too weak and small and inexperienced to talk, so my virginity did all the introductions. So he was like, hey, Dane, I'm your virginity. I'm going to make sure that you remain pure and innocent and you can have sex for a very long time. Yay! <laughs> Like, oh, how are you going to do that, virginity? Well, basically, I'm going to make it to your voice never breaks. It takes a really long time, and you don't grow any pubic hair, so you think you have a medical condition. Yay! <laughs> Which obviously made it very difficult for me to speak to girls. So I'd be with a girl and be like, hey, Simone, I really like you. She'd be like, oh, I like you too, Dane. Maybe we should take this to the next level. And then my virginity would be like, he does like you, Simone, but he likes PlayStation and FIFA and comic books and milkshakes and purity. Yay! Was tough, and then my parents would get involved, and my mum would say stuff like, Dane, your virginity keeps destroying your socks, I'm not gonna buy you any more. <laughs> under control. <laughs> and then my virginity would chime in and be like, he's just exploring himself, and sex by himself is the safest way to have it. Yay! <laughs> and that was the early part of my teenage years, until finally, my libido got big enough and strong enough to approach me too. And he came up to me one day too, and was like, hey, Dane, can I speak to you for a second, please? <laughs> What's this about, libido? Well, it's about your virginity. I was thinking it's about time that we got rid of him. <sighs> what are you saying? I'm saying that we take him out. <laughs> Permanently. <laughs> what are you guys talking about? Is it purity and innocence? Yay! <laughs> oh, oh, virginity, I didn't realize you were here. Why don't you come along for a ride to Simone's house? And just like that, after having that companion for 18 years, my virginity was gone in 7 minutes and 23 seconds. <laughs> um, that's two R&B songs, thank you very much. <laughs> and the thing is, I didn't really think I would miss my virginity, but my life was a lot less complicated before sex came along. Because all I have left now is my libido, and we have very different conversations compared to what I had with my virginity. Because I'll be out with my libido on a weekend, and he'll be like, Hey, Dane, you see that girl in the dress over there? And I'd be like, yeah, she must be cold. It is November. What the fuck did you just say? <laughs> oh, um, no, yeah, I'm, no, I see her. Oh, uh, boobies, blah, blah, blah. Because <laughs> that's the thing. Once, like, your libido awakens, then it takes over your body as a man and becomes a CEO of your manhood. And it's backed by the major shareholders, the Bulls Brothers. <laughs> Some very heartless capitalists down there. No, because it's tough, because despite having the best moral intentions, you've always got stakeholders with their own agenda. Because I'll come to them with very noble proposals, like, I'll be like, hey, guys, I'm thinking about maybe giving part of myself to somebody, getting out of the game, settling down, and raising a family. And they'll say, well, Dane, thank you for coming to the meeting. While we understand your need for paternity leave, there are still markets in Asia you have yet to exploit. What does that mean? It means, until you've been with the blonde Eskimo, you're never getting out of the game. Because <laughs> we down here are all about diversity, Danes. <laughs> Male brain can enter a special state 
a special altered mode where the chemicals of the male brain change dramatically. It, it's not for long, it's just after an event. An event occurs, and for five minutes after the event, the male brain is a very different brain than it was just before the event. <laughs> Basically, there's a build-up to the event, the event, and then after the event. And after the event, it's a completely different universe that the male brain is inhabiting. For five, most men have now gathered what I mean by the event, right? <laughs> Very happy event. It's the event. It's the good event. It's the event. <laughs> Let me put it on a medical term. In Ireland, the medical term is getting the ride. That is a term we use. The male brain is awash with hormones because they're constantly going, is this going to lead to the right? Find the right. There must be a right somewhere. This must be, is there any right here? There's no right here. Go over there. Maybe there's a right there. Constantly telling you to get the right. Then you get the right, and these chemicals fuck off somewhere, right? <laughs> you wandering around like you've been released from a hostage situation going, what just happened here? It's like the matrix being switched off. Suddenly, you see the universe as it truly is, including all the hideous decisions you've made, particularly in the build-up to the ride you've just had. <laughs> Who are you? What are we doing in this skip? Jesus, what was I thinking for the last half hour? Ladies, if you want truth from a man, you have a five-minute window post-orgasm <laughs> in which to ask him any question you want, right? And you've literally five minutes before the chemicals rush back in and the game begins again, right? <laughs> It is so profound we should take this into account, like whatever. And because the worst thing it does, it offers clarity. And clarity is a terrible thing to have when it comes to sex. Not just to sex, but to all the stuff around sex. Can I apologize to every woman in this room for the ludicrous shite that you've had foisted upon you in the name of what we find horny? <laughs> Some of which I know you only do in a kind of, because you think it's kind of an ironic little joke. You know all that kind of boo 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 doo shit, right? That we can, <laughs> that we can occasionally get you to do because you think it's a joke. You're going, ha ha ha, this is kind of a funny joke, isn't it? And we're going, yeah, yeah, just keep doing it, right? Uh, <laughs> no, but you're, you're enjoying this on an ironic level. Sure, whatever, just sing Santa Baby one more time. <laughs> I mean, lingerie is a perfect example of an entire global industry based around this not ludicrous clothing, right? If you're ever with a woman and she comes out dressed in lingerie and goes, is this what you like, is it? Is this, is, this is what you like, is it? You never feel more like an ape in a simian research laboratory <laughs> as a kindly scientist from a superior species tries to fathom how your lower brain works. <laughs> is this what you like, is it? Show me on the flashcards if this is what you like. <laughs> banana, banana. <laughs> tie on rope, tie on rope, banana, banana, tie on rope. <laughs> I mean, stockings are a great example of this. A ridiculous item of clothing, but incredibly specific. This is where the sexy is. <laughs> this exact height is where the sexy is. Don't be going lower than this. No, no hanging, you've gone below the knee. Ah, pop socks, fuck off, no. <laughs> uh, what do you enjoy myself? I always like to think about one very specific sexual fantasy. Stopping, we go in there. <laughs> right. It starts every time. I'm Ryan Gosling's doorstep. <laughs> and know where he lives. <laughs> and I knock on the door and he's out. <laughs> So, I let myself in, <laughs> naked. <laughs> I 
Have a yogurt. <laughs> you me. I watch Shrek <laughs> three <laughs> times, <laughs> and that's for doing about eight hours. Even Mendes, Ryan's wife, comes in and says. Hello, Rosie. <laughs> Ryan died. <laughs> and then she burst out crying. Her husband of five years is dead. She's on the floor and I don't know what to do. And when she can't cry anymore, I fuck her. <laughs> <laughs>